So here we go. All roads have led to this moment. After four reviews over two years, all that's left to cover is the last entry in this series, which is simply titled Alone in the Dark, or also known as Alone in the Dark Inferno for the PS3. Another seven year hiatus had passed for this series, and while The New Nightmare was the well made reboot this series needed in the early noughts, this newest entry on the other hand has a bit of an identity crisis, and can't decide if it's another reboot or a loose continuation of the original Alone in the Dark trilogy. And not only that, but this game can't decide what kind of game it wants to be, and so tries to do everything, and in my opinion, succeeds at nothing. I know this is a truly depressing note to open this video on, but I have to be honest and pay you for the worst and most likely last entry in this series. I know I'm going to get some cocky comment about me reviewing a modern title, so I'll save the trolls the trouble of pointing this out. This show is about retro gaming, so why am I reviewing a modern title? Well, so far I reviewed the first four titles in the Land Ark series, and since there is a lot of ties to the retro with this newest entry, I might as well review it and complete my series of reviews on the Alone Dark series. So let's get started. There is very little I can reveal without spoiling this game's story, but I can at least tell you the story setup. Sometime after Alone Dark 3, Edward on one of his many adventures finds an artifact. This artifact was used to contain Lucifer when he was first cast out of heaven, and without even knowing it, Edward has unleashed the devil. Lucifer, once freed, has taken possession of Edward's meat suit and is using him to do his evil bidding. Now, this is where things get very confusing. Either Edward has been possessed for the last 70 years, and in that time hasn't aged one day, or the ritual that's performed just before this game started brought Edward back from the past to the present and Osu exercised Lucifer from within him. So let me get this right. During the time Edward was possessed, he has no memories of it, and what memories he did have before being possessed were wiped by the ritual to exercise the evil within him. All that comes to mind is, what is this game's story jarring about? And why try to connect it to the original trilogy? I can understand not trying to connect this game to the new Nightmare, as too much time had passed to do that anyway, but seriously, what percentage of this game's audience will even get or understand this game's connection to the original Alone Dark trilogy? I do admire anyone making something for a small specific audience, but when you're making a AAA title costing millions of dollars, it has to be an experience that can be enjoyed by as many people as possible because that is just the nature of big budget game development. I've played and completed every game in this series, and as someone who's very acquainted with this franchise, I had more patience and understanding than the average gamer going into this game, but even I couldn't stand or even understand this game's plot. I can only imagine how lost gamers are who've only played this newest entry and don't even have the previous games as some kind of loose reference to go on. I want to say a big thanks to King Game Review for giving me his insight into this game's story. It helped me very much to explain this game's story setup, but beyond that, I was still lost. I just get the feeling the team behind this game was stuck in an awkward place. They were obviously fans of the original Lone Dark and wanted to do this newest entry justice, but they also, in some strange way, try to connect this to the original Lone Dark trilogy. The reason they tried to do this was so that you were in fact playing as the original Edward Carnby, and not the born into every generation Edward Carnby from the new Nightmare. Okay fine, but if you're going to do that you're going to need a bloody good story to pull it off, and sadly this game doesn't have one. A bad story I can forgive, but I just feel so sorry for all this game's voice actors, especially James G. Caffey, who all tried to make the best out of this game's awful, awful script. I imagine when they were making this game, someone on the Alone Dark development team said, so who should we get to voice Edward Carnby? And someone most likely said, 
How about the guy who voiced Max Payne? What's crazy is that's probably how James G. Caffey got the gig to voice Edward Carnby. Not to take anything away from James G. Caffey, I mean the man is a terrific voice actor and not many people could have brought to life a complex character like Max Payne and also do it in a believable way that shows respect for the very medium in which the performance was for, but James G. Caffey and the rest of this game's cast were simply wasted on this game. All the voice actors felt to me like they were appropriately chosen for their roles, but even their A-game voice acting couldn't save this game from its terrible incoherent script. The problem with this game's script is it's too internal. It knows what it wants to convey, but just doesn't know how to. And when this game's story forces it to do so, all we get is cryptic clues, stilted dialogue, or just plain foul language. Look, we gotta go. You two coming? She is. I'm going to the museum. The hell I am. You think I'll be safe here? Don't fuck around or I'll shoot you myself. Oh, you're a real sweetheart. Thanks, Doc. Stay safe. I don't expect Edward to fully express himself using the English language to the best of effect in the middle of a shitstorm, but to have him at least act like a fucking human being would have helped to sell his plight. But when crap happens, all Edward seems to say is fuck this, fuck that, or fuck you, and to me that is just lazy writing. Through no fault of the voice actors, this game's story along with its voice acting just doesn't work. But that's not enough of a reason to write off a game, and besides, how many great games have terrible stories and laugh be bad voice acting? At the end of the day, what truly matters is gameplay, and does Lone Dark deliver in that department? <sighs> not quite. We all know gameplay is king, and if it ain't right then the game just isn't fun. Alone and Dark has a ton of different gameplay ideas all mixed into one ideal. You're alone, and have to survive by your wits alone. This might be the reason why Edward has only one firearm on him throughout this game, and even that alone won't kill enemies. To truly get through this game you will need to look for items scattered around every location. Items range from ammo to first aid sprays, bandages, gas, booze, rags, and many more. Few items have only one use, but to get the most out of them you will have to combine them together. The reason you craft items together is to adapt them to your needs of any given moment. So let's say you've got a load of guys in front of you and you want to level the playing field. You can use your gun, but like I said it won't kill them, just knock them out for a bit. That is unless you combine your gun with gas or alcohol to create flame bullets. Seriously, you pour gas over your bullets, and then when you fire your bullets light up and burn whatever you've hit. That's cool and all, but if you did that in real life I think you would just set yourself alight. But points to Eden Games for trying something different. You don't have to keep creating flame bullets to take out most enemies. You could just grab a chair or a piece of wood and then set it alight by the nearest fire to set enemies alight, or you can just beat the crap out of monsters until you knock them out, and then drag them to the nearest source of fire. Within reason, you can choose just about any way you want to get through this game, as long as your items and environment allow you to do so. But always remember, item management is important because you only have so many item pouches in your jacket. So you need to keep an eye on what items you have, and take every opportunity to replenish your items, or discard non-need items to free up item pouches for more useful items. Really, your imagination is the only limit when using and crafting your items together. And again, since most items have more than one use, you can, let's say, use a first aid spray to heal yourself, and then a moment later you can combine it with a lighter to make a makeshift flamethrower, it's also pretty cool that you can tape duct tape around a bottle of gasoline and then pierce it with your knife to make a sticky bomb that you can light up after you've thrown it and then boom. This is a handy way of dealing with crowd control and even solving some puzzles. You have to leave it to paranoid cult fanatics to construct death defying traps to test whether or not you're the true light bringer. I will admit I did enjoy these puzzles very much but gosh darn it, the driving section that preceded it, where you had to get Edward from Central Park to the History Museum within the time limit was a right nightmare. 
The driving sections are simply a mess. Even after playing the fixed PS3 version, I can't stand these sections. What makes the driving stages even more strange is that Eden Games made Test Drive Unlimited, so they should have been able to easily implement some kind of work and driving system into a Learn Dark from their experiences with working on Test Drive. But on a side note, how would a guy from the 1930s with no memory be able to just drive a car without first being shown how to? Or even drive a forklift truck for that matter? But thanks to this game's DVD chapter system, you can easily skip these and other annoying sections of this game, like the spectral vision points you have to collect which were just blatant game pattern. Like all aspects of this game, the DVD chapter system is an interesting idea. Eden Games was obviously trying to start some new game and trend, but who really wants to enjoy or skip through parts of the games like they were watching a TV show on DVD? Okay, let's say for a moment this is a feature that some people might want, and okay, there might be one or two bits of this game you'd rather skip than deal with, but there's one problem with this feature. When you skip to a different chapter, you lose all your items and start your chosen chapter with just a gun. If you skip the game straight to a boss fight or the wrong moment in a chapter, then you're screwed. To get through this game, you're going to need a jacket full of useful items. And using the DVD chapter system interferes with this game's item management and crafting system. Something else apart from the chapter system that kept throwing me off was this game's choice of perspective. Or more like perspectives. I mean, how many perspectives does a game need anyway? I'm used to action games sticking to mainly a first or third person perspective. All that new fangled over the shoulder perspective that's been used in a lot of games in the last few years. My opinion on perspectives in video games is just stick to one. It's great this game gives you a choice of a first and a third person perspective, but it's just jarring having to keep switching between them all the time. And if you include the driving sections, then this game has three perspectives, which is just crazy. The reason this review took so long to make was because for the longest time I couldn't stand this game. I'd play it for half an hour and then I'd get so frustrated with it that I just had to turn it off and get away from this abomination for my own sanity. After a long time playing this on and off, I started to stop hating this game. Well, at least long enough to finally review it. The freakiest thing with writing this review was I couldn't find much to really complain about with the actual core gameplay, but at the same time I could barely find anything to praise it for either. If it wasn't for the fact that everyone seems to hate this game, then I would just simply say Alone in Dark just wasn't for me. I think why this game fails, well for me at least, is because it just tried too much. Gameplay wise, this game does average first and third person combat, puzzle solving and minor exploration. The driving sections are just terrible and this game's story makes no bloody sense. And to top it off, this game still feels underdeveloped. Playing this game is like playing a rough concept game that still has a long way to go before you could maybe call it a fun playable game you could release one day. But despite all this game's problems, I did find two positives. One was a soundtrack, which I'll get to in a bit, and the other was a stunning visual presentation. I'm a retro gamer, so anything beyond the 32-bit and 64-bit generation looks amazing to me. Maybe that means I have no objectivity to judge newer games visually, or I'm just modest in my judgement of them. But either way, here's my take on the graphics of this game. They look pretty good at least on par with most games from around the time this came out. But there are a few moments where this game does stand out from the crowd, like with its realistic facial animation and dynamic lighting. This game's set pieces are all interesting indeed, but a little over the top for my liking. But I do have to give credit to at least one set piece, and that was the one right at the beginning of the game where Edward is left hanging is truly breathtaking and oh so terrifying. While this game isn't set on rails, there isn't all that much exploration to be had. 
but the few moments where you're given complete free reign to go wherever you want, or so you could do spirit vision quests. Yay. But as I said before, this just felt like game pattern and didn't really add much to the story or the overall game experience. I got the impression while playing this game that it was originally meant to be more free roaming and set almost entirely in Central Park, but was scaled back during development to have more traditional self-contained levels. But hey, at least this game's fire effects are amazing and up to Beyond Two Souls release, Alone in Dark held the title of best fire effects in any video game. Fire is an important element in this game and needed to be accurately portrayed. Fire lights your way, it kills enemies, and also burns your way through closed off areas. But because of that fire, you're never truly alone in the dark. But I don't think the fire effects needed to be as good as they were, considering the time the development team must have spent to get them right. That time could have been better spent on, oh I don't know, how about maybe polishing up other areas of the game that desperately needed extra attention. When gamers are saying to each other, hey, have you played the newest Lone Dark game? I hear it's got some of the best fire effects ever. I think when gamers were saying that to each other, they were actually being ironic. Fire is this game's gimmick, and maybe a way to evolve this series and try something new, but you can't build a whole game around it, all used as a selling point. And while we're talking about selling points, we might as well talk about the different ports. The most common version of Alone and Dark is the Xbox 360 version, but since the 360 and PC versions are basically the same game, we might as well lump them together and talk about them if they're the same game. The best way to describe these versions is they're unfinished. The final process in any game development is fine tuning the gameplay and bug fixing. But from playing these two versions it's obvious this just didn't happen and because of that these games are unplayable. Control and Edward in these versions just felt awkward and unresponsive. You can't change the camera angle and because of that fixed perspective you can't really see where you're going properly. This game is just one big glitch and you don't have to walk far before you see graphical glitches, game sequences that just don't trigger when they're meant to, and the final nail in the coffin? The driving sections are quite frankly broken. Visually this game looks about the same as the PS3 release, but doesn't have that final polish that at least makes Inferno playable. With the bar being so low, the PS3 and Wii ports can't make things any worse. Right? The only difference between these ports is the PS2 version uses a controller and the Wii version uses motion controls. It is a shame the Wii port doesn't have an option to use the classic controller, but let's just dive into these ports anyway. Without playing these ports, what I expected was a visually downgraded version of this game with maybe a few things taken out due to technical limitations but what I got instead totally surprised me, and not in a good way. Playing both these ports is like playing a different game that's so much worse than the Xbox and PC versions. But where do I start? Well, all the voice acting is done by different actors with a completely different script. The graphics don't just look downgraded, they look completely different, as well as the gameplay which is so much worse. And what doesn't do the gameplay any favours is that you don't have anywhere near as many checkpoints as the 360 and PC versions. Honestly, I could make a whole episode just about the PS2 and Wii versions of Alone and Dark, but I just simply haven't got the time to talk any more about them in this review. So I'll leave it at that both completely different and much worse than the Xbox 360 and PC versions. Avoid these ports. Heck avoid every version of this game, but if you absolutely must play this game, then I would suggest the PS3 ports, as it's the only version that you technically could call a game that works, and this was the version I based this review on. Almost all the game crippling bugs found in the 360 and PC versions are fixed for the PS3 release, but the ultimate problem with the PS3 release is that it's still based on the same broken foundation as the Xbox and PC versions, and if something has a bad foundation, then no matter how hard you try to, it just, it just can't be saved. 
whatever version of this game you choose to play, you're gonna have some pretty cool music to go along with it. I can honestly say the only thing I liked about this game was its music. For me, it was the glue that kept this game together and gave it any sort of atmosphere and emotional direction. The game was composed by Oliver Divier, who has composed soundtracks to video games like Obscure 1 and 2, Remember Me, and Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag. But the icing on the cake to the soundtrack was the amazing eerie performance of the Bulgarian state television female vocal choir, who are simply known as the Mystery of the Bulgarian Voice. It's fair to say the soundtrack simply stole the show and is some of the best modern video game music I've heard in years. The only complaint I have about the soundtrack was that a real orchestra wasn't used. Instead, it was all done in a digital environment. But if you're like me and wonder what the soundtrack could have been like had it in fact been performed by a real orchestra, then just Google a Lone Dark Orchestra to see how incredible this music score is when played live. Well, that's every game in the series covered. When I reviewed the first game two years ago, I had no intention of reviewing the rest of the games in the series, as someone must have covered them by now. But what surprised me the most was that no one had, and it fell upon me to review every game in the series, and along the way, document its fascinating history. And on that note, there's still a few loose ends left to cover regarding this game's recent history, and the future of the series. Eden Games was bought by Infograms in 2002. Once Eden had become part of Infograms slash Atari, they immediately pitched a new Alone and Dark game. The first pitch was turned down because, wait for it, Atari felt the idea was too over the top and too much of an undertaking. <laughs> yeah, shocker, right? But they were given a second chance to pitch a more grounded vision of the idea in a tech demo. The second pitch was successful, and the tech demo was developed into a full game. An early trailer was shown to the press in 2006, and while the game was still a long way off from being finished, this trailer did show a lot of potential and got gamers, and the game press excited about this game. But could this trailer keep people interested for two years? Well, nope. You see, a lot of the buzz from that trailer had gone by the time the game was released in mid-2008, and many of the unique features first showcased in it had been done by other games in those two years, and were now commonplace. When Alone in the Dark did finally come out, it was greeted with less than impressive review scores. Apart from a handful of positive reviews, almost all media outlets gave this game negative reviews. This isn't the first time a highly anticipated game has come out to negative reviews, but what made things much worse was how Atari reacted to them. Well, the first thing Atari did was demand that several European sites remove their reviews because they broke the embargo date that you can post your review on. Of course, if you were given this game a positive review, then that's okay if you break this date, which is more of a gentleman's agreement anyway. And if that wasn't enough, they accused German site 4Players and Norwegian site Gamer.no of illegally obtaining their review copies. Both sites were threatened with legal action from Atari, but both claimed to have gotten their review copies through legal means. Whether these two sites did in fact give unfair reviews, or got their review copies through less than legal means isn't the real issue here. What is the real issue is that the world's media unanimously said this is a bad game, and Atari attacked back. The demo came out sometime after this game's release, and because of all the controversy surrounding it, people were all ready to hate this game long before they played it. By having the demo come out sometime after this game's release, it sent a clear message to gamers that Atari was doing damage control by not letting gamers find out how good or most likely, how bad this game was. If the bad reviews and demo controversy wasn't bad enough, 
The fact that the Xbox 360 and PC versions never got a patch to fix all the problems didn't help this game's cause. It's from my understanding that most work on creating a patch for the 360 and PC releases was done, but for reasons unknown Atari decided to never finish and release it. I can understand why the 360 version didn't get the patch, because most patches for that system are small quick downloadable fixes, and to make a patch to fix all the problems would have not only been a technical challenge, but at the time a costly one. Even still, that doesn't excuse releasing unfinished or buggy software to begin with. As for the PC version, there is no good reason why it couldn't have been brought up to the same standard as the PS3 release. The PS3 version was delayed initially because Eden Games was still figuring out how to develop for the PS3, and because of that, the PS3 version would not be ready for the same multi-platform day release. Alone in a Dark Inferno 4, the PS3 is simply the original game, but with all the fixes that were planned for the Xbox and PC versions, with a whole new gameplay sequence added. Most likely this new gameplay sequence was originally planned as DLC that was never released for the Xbox 360 and simply included in the PS3 release to sweeten the pot. So ultimately the patch wasn't cancelled, but simply developed and worked into the development of the PS3 release. I do give the PS3 version credit as all the problems with the original game were fixed and additional patches were released to fix problems that Eden Games had overlooked. It's a good thing the PS3 release was delayed in the end, or we might have all been stuck with the same buggy and unplayable game. I do feel bad for this game because it was conceived with the best of intentions, but due to Eden Games being over ambitious, and a mountain of problems that arose during development, this title missed the mark and will forever be known as a game of so much wasted potential. But despite everything that happened, this game did still sell a fair few copies. Combined sales numbers totaled around 1.2 million, which makes this the second best selling game in this series. I don't think this game was a financial success, but if you believe what Atari was saying, then not only would you believe this game was in fact a financial success, but that they were also planning a sequel. In the end, however, both these things were ultimately untrue. We never did get a sequel to this game, and while making it, Atari were in financial trouble. They desperately needed this game to shift between 2 to 3 million copies to keep the company in its current form afloat and that simply wasn't going to happen. Atari SA, formerly known as Infograms, went bankrupt in early 2013. In 2008, Infograms took over Atari US and rebranded itself Atari SA. Now fast forward back to 2014 and Atari SA is no more, but Atari, formerly Atari US, has come out of this bankruptcy intact and has now set itself up as a studio who pays other developers to make games based on their own intellectual properties rather than internally create them themselves. In an effort to balance the books, Atari Consolium tried to sell all the franchises off in one hit and there was no takers for the whole back catalogue of IPs. After this failed, Atari tried to sell them off one by one, and because of this, it is unclear what franchises Atari still owns, but the recent ISO release of the first Alone in the Dark seems to suggest that Atari still owns this franchise. When I found out about the recent ISO release of the first game, not only was I gutted, but I also had to rewrite this part of the history section. Originally I wrote about how I hoped this franchise would be sold to another developer who might inject some new life into this series, and I also wrote a bit about the nature of rights to an IP, and how there was a slim chance this series could revert back to the creator of the original game. I do hope one way or another this series is back in the cable hands of Frederick Reynold. In 2012, the original Alone Dark game turned 20 years old, 
And you would think with the popularity of HD remakes and re-releases, this would be the perfect opportunity to give the original game a facelift. But nope, nothing was done to mark this series 20th anniversary. The creator of the original game, Frederick Reynald, said in his post-mortem at the Game Developers Conference in 2012, I would love a HD remake one day, and I hope it will happen. So far there hasn't been a HD re-release of the original game, but here's hoping for some kind of HD remake for the series 25th anniversary. But due to recent developments with Atari, we may never get another Lone Dark game or that HD re-release, or so I thought. Just when I thought there was no stone left unturned, a former employee of Eden Games uploaded 9 minutes of footage from a cancelled remake of the original game in early 2014. From my understanding, this game would have been a complete remake of the original game using the Lone Dark 2008 engine. This was a small project with only 5 people working on it, and the intention was to sell this game as a downloadable title only. From looking at the leaked footage, this project shows an amazing amount of potential, but with the commercial failure of the 5th Alone Dark game, and at the time Atari's appendant bankruptcy, both these things pretty much killed off this project in its early stages of development. It's such a shame because I would have much rather played this low-key remake than the big epic failure that was simply titled Alone in the Dark. So my final thoughts. This series had one of the best starts ever with the first game and one of the best reboots of all time with New Nightmare. If the 2008 entry is indeed the last Lone Dark game, then what a depressing end to the series. I still believe in the original premise of the first game, and feel that within the right hands there is still untapped potential waiting within this series. What will happen to the series in the end, who knows. If there is ever another Lone Dark game, then I'll happily review it. But until then, thank you for watching this and the rest of my reviews in the Lone Dark series.